in the waning twilight of the 1890s, Colonel Lewis A. Watrous gazed upon a mountain valley shrouded in mist, cradling the Wallenpaupeck River with its cascading falls veiled in the whispers of the past. The spirits of the Lenape Indians, guardians of the land before the 1800s, lingered in the shadows as European settlers carved their mark upon the earth, building towns to serve the growing industries of coal, lumber, fur, and stone. From his perch, Colonel Watrous beheld Wilsonville, a spectral echo of its former bustling self. Named after Judge James Wilson, a signer of the Declaration of Independence, this valley, once filled with industrial mills, now lay desolate, its heartbeat fading with the depletion of nature's resources. Yet amidst this decline, the colonel glimpsed the future, a great lake, a reservoir of power, coursing through the veins of transmission lines, providing power for his dream of electric trains throughout the Northeast. Thus, the Paul Pack Power Company emerged, purchasing swaths of land throughout the river valley, and by 1913, they had ensnared 15,000 acres. But like the industrial mills of the past, the dream of electric trains dissolved in a haze of reality, and the 15,000 acres of land and the project was sold to Pennsylvania Power and Light. PPNL started the work for what was the largest and most ambitious power generation projects of its time. The dam, a monument to human endeavor, rose like a specter in 1924, shrouded in challenges. Cemeteries displaced, communities submerged as the river of progress flowed, swallowing the past in its watery embrace. Whispers echoing beneath the waves from the unmarked graves of the Lenape, guardians of a forgotten time. The hydroelectric dam project was engineered to create the largest lake in Pennsylvania, covering 5,700 acres with a length of 13 miles and 52 miles of shoreline. The dam that was to create this great lake was designed to be 1,280 feet wide and 70 feet high. Water would be channeled into a 14 foot diameter wooden flume that would run three and a half miles with a total drop of over 800 feet. The water would enter a surge tank that would regulate the water flowing through the flume at a rate of 928,000 gallons per minute. The surge tank would keep the flume from blowing out due to the extreme water pressure and regulate the flow. The flowing water would run two generators that would produce 44 megawatts of power. In order to get construction materials to the generator site, a rail line had to be constructed from the dam site. A 1,000 foot dike needed to be built at Tafton and over 16 miles of state, county, and township roads and utility poles had to be rerouted. A new bridge also had to be constructed. This new bridge would connect Pike and Wayne counties since the existing bridge in Wilsonville would be underwater. This endeavor would require a massive amount of labor and resources, an upward estimate of over 3,000 workers, hundreds of tons of concrete, lumber, and tons of steel. Housing, as well as dining and recreation halls, would also need to be constructed in support of this massive workforce. The PPO plan also included the construction of a radio station in Tafton to provide communication between the construction site and the PPL offices in New York City and Allentown. The construction started June 17, 1924. This was dangerous work especially with the number of men and mechanical equipment involved. Bulldozers, steam shovels, trucks, and teams of horses. The added distraction of hundreds of visitors showing up at the construction site to watch the activity made this somewhat of a precarious situation. 
due to the project's sheer size, it was expected that there would be injuries and some loss of life. From the depths of the Lackawaxen River to the heights of the dam, tragedies unfolded. These stories weave a tapestry of sorrow. Accidents, mysterious deaths, each shadowed by whispers from beyond. It wasn't long before the darkness descended on Wilsonville. On July 18, 1924, Joseph Warner from nearby Holly was crushed beneath the wheels of fate after falling from a truck he was riding in and somehow landed beneath the truck, getting run over by the back tires of the vehicle. This freak accident was regarded by many superstitious employees to be the work of the restless spirits who did not want the land to be flooded. Later that summer, Walter Vratinsky of Hazleton was poisoned by spirits unseen. After work one summer night in 1924, Walter joined several of his fellow workers who drove to a local home where they drank elderberry wine. Suddenly, he collapsed and fell out of his chair. His friends, assuming that he was overcome with liquor, took him back to the company garage in Wilsonville. They put him in the bed of the truck and covered him with blankets. Later that evening, a friend working the night shift went to check on him and found him stone cold dead. Authorities were called to investigate. Even though the circumstances were unusual, the coroner ruled the cause of death was strangulation by acute alcoholism. But according to the Scranton Times article, the wine was poisonous. Shortly after this incident, Murdo D. McDonough was swallowed by the Lackawaxen River's watery embrace at the Kimball's generating site. He dove into the water and hit a large rock. He was so badly injured that he couldn't swim and drowned before help could reach him. Others at the scene said it looked like McDonald was pushed into the water, although there was no one near him at the time of the incident. As the dam progressed, so did the death toll. 30-year-old Gideon Buchanan lost his life after being crushed by a derrick bucket. The operator of the derrick involved in the accident quit, unable to deal with the man's death. Frank Kuman suddenly died of cardiac asthma at the company barracks in Wilsonville. And as for 25-year-old Barney Rafferty, found dead on the banks of the Lackawaxen River below Kimball's, a cause of death could not be determined. More lives were lost that summer. Ulysses Brooks, responsible for managing a group of workmen constructing a road near the dam, set charges to blast rock out of the way. When the dynamite went off, he was not far enough away from the explosion and was badly hurt by the blast. He sadly passed away a few hours later from his gruesome injuries. Another victim, Rudolf Nissen, a civil engineer working on the generation station, was killed by a flying stone after he left the protective dugout, believing that the blast was finished. Witnesses in the bunker thought he heard someone say, all clear, before he left the bunker. Other losses of life that year included three men killed when the truck carrying stone tipped over and rolled over them. A fourth worker was killed after being hit by the bucket of a steam shovel. Over the years, there have been countless stories of people who lost their lives on the Wallenpawpeck River. Three men drowned near Wilsonville when the ice they were crossing gave way. From the time of the earliest settlers, the waters of the Wallenpawpeck River have claimed many souls. The river yielded to the dam's embrace, its waters a mirror of the past, reflecting the submerged echoes of the lost lives and forgotten dreams. Lake Wallenpawpeck, a reservoir of souls Whisper secrets of a bygone era, where the spectral town of Wilsonville lies submerged, its streets haunted by the ghost of Wallenpawpack.